Greetings, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today, we're going to look at everyday objects and processes through a special lens, mathematics, and it's not scary at all. It changes, however, the way we view the world around us. Our very special guest has probably contributed more than anyone to how nature's forms, processes, and systems are governed by mathematical rules. Dr. L. Mahadevan is the developing uh, professor of applied mathematics and professor of organismic and evolutionary biology and professor of physics at Harvard University. He has accumulated any number of awards. Dr. Mahadevan is an essential expert, not only for the science community, but for the general public and educators as well. Today, we'll see why. He'll discuss a few of his current projects, including how mathematical rules govern construction of, say, social insects nests and the stages of biological development and other interesting phenomena that are absolutely amazing when he shows us how to really observe nature. You'll want to check his lab's website for many other projects. Meanwhile, we're very honored to welcome Dr. Maha Mahadevan. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you very much, Ron. Very nice to be here <laughs> again. And <clears throat> you have done so much. We hardly know where to start, but I will just ask you uh, 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 for starters here that um, there are so many ways, so many things that are in our ordinary experience, everyday things that we see, and you have worked for ages to reveal the mathematical foundations underneath these uh, phenomena. Would you please give us uh, some clues about what you're working on presently? Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I'll try. So. I have recently been thinking a fair bit about problems at the boundary between physics and biology, initially starting out from understanding uh, morphogenesis, <clears throat> how form arises in biology, increasingly thinking about how form can be functional, um, you know, how do animals build complex architectures, uh, how does a termite build a mound, how does a bird, like the buffalo weaver bird, build um, the nest that you can see hanging from the acacia. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, how ants build complex nests. And how these nests are actually, or the mounds, or any of these architectures, how they are functional. So what do I mean by that? Um, uh, Winston Churchill famously said that uh, we build buildings. And then our behavior is changed by the buildings that we build. Mm. So our behavior leads to buildings, but then when we build buildings and we are in, in, in part of them, in, in them, then they change our behavior. As you can see, you know, we can be comfortable, we can be in uh, ordinary regular clothes when we are within a nice warm building. <clears throat> but now there's a problem. How do you try and create an environment which is neither completely permeable to the outer world, so a micro environment, which is neither completely permeable nor completely insulated. If it is completely insulated, you will never get anything from outside. You will not be able to get food, you'll not be able to get water, you'll not be able to get nutrition, um, you won't be able to get energy. That's bad. If it was completely permeable, then you are subject to the vagaries of the environment. If it's very cold outside, it's going to be very cold inside. If there's no food outside, there's no food inside. So you have to figure out a way in which you build these semi-permeable, not completely porous, but not completely impervious mm -hmm. either, mm -hmm. boundaries. And one of the things that I've started to get fascinated by is trying to understand how we, humans, do this, how animals do this. It's a little easier to study animals. Uh, um, and then ask the question whether there are similarities between how that happens 
in the context of social insects, uh, how that happens perhaps in the context of other social organisms, but also how that might actually lead uh, us to understand how our own body is a combination, is a collection of many different kinds of cells which come together and create this multicellular organism. Each tissue does its own thing, each organ does its own thing, but of course it depends on other organs and then together they make the whole. So there is this continuous crosstalk, continuous talk between different parts of the body um, where they have to cooperate with each other to be able to ensure that the body is doing what it can to uh, survive. Um, but at the same time, they have to also ensure that this cooperation is not so strong that it weakens the system to an invasion from the outside. So kinds of questions that we're interested in initially started out in morphogenesis and physics and biology and gradually are moving towards questions associated with cooperation, competition, and understanding how large collections can essentially function. And in your work, it always goes back to some underlying mathematical formula uh, or rule. And that is the most fascinating thing. I remember seeing the lecture of yours and I could hardly sleep after it was, I noticed everything in nature suddenly. And it was a uh, very simple to us phenomena, but there was this underlying mathematical system or rule. Is that what you're looking for here with the social insects, the morphogenesis and so on? Yeah, trying to understand things from a quantitative perspective is something that I've been interested in for a long time. Sometimes you succeed, most of the time you fail. Um, that's the mm. nature of, 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 of the whole game. Uh, these principles, if we can find them, we hope, I hope, uh, are translatable so that they can go from one system to the other. You know, I was mentioning understanding aspects of social insect colonies, but perhaps use that to understand at a mathematical level analogies between that and maybe a multicellular organism. If you understand competition and cooperation in a multicellular organism, can you then translate it back to what might happen in a social uh, insect colony and back and forth. So mathematics plays the role of a language. It yes. plays the role therefore of metaphor uh, or allegory, um, you know, in, in, in literature, metaphors are very powerful because they allow you to connect things which might originally seem disparate. In mathematics, we use the same thing, except that it's done through equations. Yes. Um, is there, a, what do I want to say, a prejudice in all this system, of this underlying system of mathematics toward geometry, that this comes up again and again and again, that there seems to be a geometric, uh, what do I want, a set of rules under there somewhere that says you can do this, but not that. It can, issues, constraints, and possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Geometry is one of the okay. uh, ways. Uh, mathematics, at least the way I think of it, I think many people think of it as the study of patterns. Uh, and if you're thinking about studying patterns, you can study patterns geometrically. Yes. Uh, you don't have to, you can study patterns analytically, you can also study patterns algebraically, um, and finally you can study patterns if you want in terms of topology. Um, um, I, for reasons which perhaps are not going to be very clear in a short conversation, have been drawn to geometry, and I think it's primarily, at least in my case, associated with just the fact that that's a way in which I think very visually, um, you know, um, it, it's one lens. It's not the only lens. Um, right. I I understand, but that's the beauty of your work. It always comes. It seems as though it takes you back to some underlying set of rules that seem to possibly generate the possibility. So when you're looking at these constructions by insects, the termite nests, say spider webs, termite nests, uh, uh, other ant colony nests, bees nests, there's always this kind of 
set, I, 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 I may have the wrong term here, of sort of generative rules under there. You can do this, but you cannot do that because it won't work if you do things the wrong yeah. way. Um, can, can, is, if that's true, can you give like an example of that kind of constraint? Yeah, so I think what you're referring to uh, is uh, the role of function. Okay. So, you know, um, form and function are intimately connected to each other uh, yeah. in the engineered world. They are also intimately connected to each other in the living biological world, the evolved world, if you will. Um, and then there is a third leg to that, if you will. Uh, and the third leg to that is, you know, what it is made of. It's not, form, of course, uh, is an abstract sense. Yes. Uh, uh, but then if you want to really build something with a particular form, you've got to choose. It's a spider web. It's built of um, silk, spider silk. Uh, spider silk, which essentially has different properties in the radial direction and different properties yes, uh, right. along the circumferential direction. Uh, if you're building a termite, or the termite is building a, a termite turret or a termite mound, it's made of uh, mud and clay and um, and and uh, saliva, if you will. Um, uh, a bird's nest, like the one that you can see, you know, is made of right. twigs, twigs of different sizes. So you were asking about how this might happen. Uh, are there geometrical rules? Um, uh, so well, there are geometrical possibilities, uh, but the possibilities are very large. And so the fact that now certain kinds of animals, just because of the environment they live in, have access to certain kinds of materials, reduces the number of possibilities. And then function further constrains what needs to be done, not what can be done, but what needs yeah. to be done. As I said, you know, a nest helps basically protect the organism or the collective from predation, it also protects it from rapid changes in the environment. It also provides a place where you can essentially store food, take care of the brood when it's young. So all these different functions constrain further and further what can happen. And our simple picture has been, if you can understand that qualitatively, then can you then, can you build, bring in, you know, a mathematical language which makes it quantitative to ask under what conditions will you get what kinds of structures. Right, and uh, the way that you do things, it tends to open up that reality a great deal so that you see in what would be everyday or ordinary kinds of phenomena, you see it in a very different way and or you have that effect on people that, <laughs> that you teach or uh, demonstrate that too. Uh, there are other things. Uh, there are systems that uh, you mentioned that you were working on neuroscience and robotics and stuff. Did you want to say anything about that, that what your work is in terms of, there is a like a geometry of motion and that sort of thing. Is that what you were thinking of? So two, two things that we've just started uh, working on. Um, uh, one is associated with, how we learn geometry and what type of geometry might be innate, if indeed there is any geometry mm -hmm. which is innate to us. So, and this is, I think in my context, just a natural consequence of uh, the problems that I've worked on in the past. Previously, I was a practitioner with using geometry, using mathematics, uh, uh, different kinds of mathematics to try and understand the world as it is. Uh, and then over time, I have started to wonder a little bit about what is the nature of mathematics that might be in our minds. And I don't mean human minds, I mean animal minds. Yeah, more broadly. Right. Uh, and that's not a formal mathematics uh, in the sense of symbols, in the sense of ability to essentially manipulate symbols as we are used to, uh, but more in an experiential sense. You know, for example, a bee needs to essentially find its home uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as does a bird uh, uh, or nest or home. How does it do that? So that is uh, an experiential and an existential question, mm -hmm. but it's also a mathematical question because mm -hmm. you have to ask, you could ask the question of what are the algorithms that it uses? How does it correct for errors? Um, 
and how does it learn both the algorithms and the error correcting mechanisms? And so we've started to address that kind of question or that class of question initially in the context of insects, uh, particularly favoring and focusing on the dung beetle um, because it has this remarkable ability to essentially move more or less along a straight line uh, oh. and roll dung as, as it does so. Um, mm -hmm. and the question is how? Because to move along a straight line is very non-trivial. There are many, many ways of being non-straight, but only one way of being straight. So how do you do that? So you need an error correcting mechanism. And so we've been working with some collaborators of us to understand that. A different kind of question in a human context is, do we know Euclid's axioms? Uh, do we know Euclid's geometry? Intuitively. Intuitively. We are taught that in school, um, but do we have an experiential sense of that? How can we test that? So with children, you might ask them to basically move from one vertex of a triangle on the ground to another and ask them the sense of how they have to change their orientation when they go to one vertex mm -hmm. to another vertex and so on. And then ask, does the sum of the angles in their mind <laughs> add up to two right angles? With an adult, I can show you, you know, two vertices of a triangle and then yeah. ask you, where is the third vertex? And you might tell me it is also so, uh, and you might also tell me what the angle is. And then I can use that to extract whether or not you know that the sum, intuitively, that the sum of the angles of a triangle add up to two right angles. And we can do that with everybody in between, not just a child, not just an adult, and everybody in between, whether or not they've essentially had a formal education or not. We can measure the errors. From the errors, we can try and deduce something about the machinery and the mechanism that might be at play. We don't go into the neural circuits. We want to understand yes. much more at a coarse level what kinds of patterns are either learned or built in. And what's the aim? The aim is to ask, of all the different ways in which you can solve these problems, are there some ways which come up again and again? Um, yes. Uh, in different animals, despite the fact that they have very different kinds of brains and different kinds of circuits. Uh, so it's kind of going exactly in the reverse direction rather than by thinking about molecules and then neural circuits and then understanding and we want to go from the outside in. Yes. Okay because if different animals, all of them have to have solved the same problem. Navigation yes. is a very basic yes. question. And they may be using different machines and mechanisms, machinery and mechanisms, but they have to solve the same problem. Right. And so are there mathematical rules which essentially constrain the ways in which you can solve that problem when you're susceptible to errors? Right. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it's beautiful, as a matter of fact. and. Uh, I, again, you're the only person that I know of really looking at this, like on a very large scale uh, across all sorts of disciplines and, and so on. But um, on that, the contrary, we just use the same simple thing again and again. So. And that's just <laughs> it. But uh, finding that would be just a huge revelation. That's it seems as though that would be logical in nature that you'd start out with some subset of these, I, I don't know what to call them, you do, rules or whatever, and it is generates, it doesn't matter what the species is, what the form is, but it has constraints that, and these other creatures know this by instinct and they correct and also- yeah. well, But then that, that becomes a question of what is instinct? And yes, is, uh, right. Is, is instinct instinct? Is it learned? And yeah. it turns out it's- not clear. Uh, some right. things are truly hardwired, um, but many things are not. And the reason, right. the advantage of not hardwiring everything is, of course, that you become adaptable. If you're not right. hardwired, then you have the ability to adapt to the environment. On the other hand, that's slow. If on the other hand, if on, uh, on the one hand, if you are, everything is hardwired, you're fast, but you're not adaptable. Right. And so again, you have this, competition. You want yes. to be very adaptable and therefore perhaps slow in learning like humans, or do you want to be able to do everything very fast, but then you are likely not to be adaptable or robust. On the other hand, you can do certain things very, very quickly. And so you may right. be 
capable of having a competitive advantage some ways. Yeah, and it seems even when you mention adaptations that there are a range of possibilities with different species uh, that, that certain things they can adapt to and exactly. other things they cannot adapt to. And just one more thing, I, I can't help but mention this, uh, that it, when you talk about instinct with animals and then we call it intuition in humans <laughs> that that a lot of your thinking is probably intuitive at first then you have to go out and kind of try to find the evidence and so on but you have the idea up ahead partly the idea yeah. but but partly you have to, have to first observe you have to have uh, enough yes, observations to build the idea and then you abstract it and then you crystallize it if you can mathematically and then you go back to the field to try and test it. Um, right. So it's not, it's to me not just a arc, it's a loop and you keep yeah. going around the loop um, and sometimes That's just never get out of it. It's, it's very interesting. I would just like to mention, I have a couple of other things to ask you about, but you, as I say, have covered a great number of things. And I'm going to suggest that viewers take a look at that website because you, you do things with paper, just the crushing of paper, just wrinkles and, you know, all kinds of things have this underlying structure when you really look at them. And I think, uh, I think your website, these categories, it's accessible to anybody. It, you don't have to be a mathematician. You don't have to be a scientist to understand your point there. So that's much appreciated. But even looking at that range of fascinating phenomena that you look at, fascinating every day <laughs> that you look at, um, it really does open a person's mind. A Thank great you. One more quick thing in here is that you seem to work across scales. You see the same thing regardless of scale. And I was wondering if there are limits, uh, constraints according to scale. And I think I might have asked you like, the folding of DNA in the cell is is just almost miraculous. Like, that's very hard to understand. It's a very long object folded up, and it has to be very precise. The folding of proteins has to be the, this this that sort of thing at one scale, and then other things at the macro scale or at the cosmic scale. Is that immaterial? In from what you've observed, scale doesn't matter. No, it very much does matter because the kinds of forces that are at play are indeed functions of scale. So on very ah. small scales, uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, it's small means it's getting continuously buffeted around by the fact that we are all, you know, 300 degrees Kelvin, you know, 25 odd degrees centigrade. So there is a thermal energy in that causes things to fluctuate around. If I'm on a large scale like you or me, that effect is not very much. If I'm on an even larger scale like that of a galaxy, now gravitational forces, which are typically rather weak on our scale now, can start to become very, very important. Uh, so scale is in very, very important. Um, so it's not just the geometry, it is the physics, and the physics is... Ah. Okay. intimately connected to what scale you're working on. If you go to very small scales, different kinds of forces. If you look at the human scale, which is what I've mostly focused on, um, yet different. And if I go to very large scales, still different. Um, the human scale seems to be the most messy. And I don't know whether that's an accident, <laughs> uh, because there are lots of things which are happening simultaneously. Yes, yes. Um, that's, that's, it's not that's, as clean as the subatomic. Yes. It's not as clean as the supergalactic, if you will. Oh. Right, right. Uh, thank you for, for that. It's a whole, it uh, seems like that should be a whole book somewhere or something because it, uh, uh, I wasn't so sure whether the scale really mattered or not. Before we go, I love one of the things that you have pointed out, um, I think many times, that boundaries between a lot of the sciences, between science and math, uh, between science and art, that's a big one. These are kind of artificial boundaries and you have worked hard to push the thinking beyond these little uh, boundaries. So uh, 
Is it, are you able to convince other people? Is there a movement in this direction at last? I actually don't think it's a new movement. I think people in the past didn't think that there were boundaries. I think, uh, 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 you know, uh, at the beginning of at the dawn of science with, yes. uh, there wasn't, you know, right. you, it was all right. a continuum. Um, right. I think it's a nature of the enterprise that as you know more, no one individual can have a vast enough repertoire of knowledge or expertise. And so what happens is that people naturally tend to basically work in a domain and that domain then gets a name. And then as they basically focus some more, then you get another domain or a subdomain and that gets a name. Yes. Um, so I think it's a natural progression, but I, I, I think, and I'm hardly the only one who thinks that way, is that at the boundaries between domains, uh, there's a lot of ferment. Um, and so if you can maintain yourself by not being buffeted too much by the ferment, you can also find creative over there and you can you know thrive and I tried perhaps failed more often than I've succeeded but that's okay uh, no you see that that direction is coming up more spontaneously I think I think in recent times that a lot of people are a lot more people are interdisciplinary mm -hmm for instance, or work in groups where you have multiple areas of expertise and you put it all together. Uh, that sort of thing, there's a collective kind of thing, but the people realize that you can't do a lot of things in science with just locked in, in one teeny weeny perspective or discipline. And I just realized that you've broken with that a long time ago, that you got past these boundaries. Yeah, but that's not uncommon, I think. Uh Ah, well, I hope hope not. I uh, see it a great deal that people tend to be extremely narrow, uh, but that uh, uh, you have been uh, the exception in that, in being super broad. <laughs> that, uh, and very shallow, probably. They're breaking down all those stuff <laughs> and so on. But in any case, uh, this has been most interesting. I do hope people will take a look at the website because I think there's imagery, things that help uh, make that clear, but uh, I'm waiting for the movie now, <laughs> the Mahatovan movie that will explain uh, and show and tell so much of the work that you do, which is an enormous contribution. Dr. Mahadevan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real thank pleasure. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Okay.